Welcome to Span Reads, not your typical rereads podcast, a 17 shard series where we read, read Brendan Sanderson's works and our giant nerds about it. Unlike the traditional reread style, we won't be going through each book chapter by chapter, but instead looking at different themes within the series. We will be doing three episodes, re reactions and retrospectives, character relationships, and then a third episode on lore. As this is the last book in the series, we will be doing full spoilers during these episodes. As such, this is our warning to viewers and listeners so that there will be full spoilers for all Skyward novels, excluding Defiant, from this point forward. Today we will be talking about Cytonic. Joining me is Jesse. Hello, I'm Lady Lameness. Ian. Hey, I'm your writer. Eric. Hey, I'm Gas. And I'm Mish, your first Rainbow Rose. So, recaps and retrospectives. Who wants to start us off? Well, first you can go to Jesse's channel for oh. a recap of Cytonic. And yes. so I'll put that in the upper left-hand side and in the description if you want to see that. Yes. It's really good, if I do say so myself, because I rewatched it yesterday. <laughs> 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 it was very informative for this episode. Even though you'd reread re the book. I did reread the book. I just skipped a bunch of chapters in it. <laughs> well, it's still a pleasure to have you, Jesse, because we didn't think we were going to get you for this yes. one. I, I, I was considering not doing this one. It's true. This book, man, on a reread, I think I like the beginning parts of this book less. But I still really like the ending. Like, I think the ending's really good. Everything after the pirate champion battle is awesome. Like, the battle for sure hold it on to the end. Fantastic. Love it. It's the stuff beforehand where it's like, oh, we have to become pirate champion. And oh, let's talk to all. Let's do the chapter where we just learn all this new cruise backstory. It's literally a chapter where we just Spencer just goes through everyone in Cutlass Flight and asks for their backstory, which is all like I like those characters and things. It's just, eh, you know, it's a bunch of yeah. backstory that basically won't matter. Yeah, yeah, right, exactly, <laughs> correct. I have a theory about that because we know that Jancy's doing more novels after the end of Defiant, and I would not put it past her to bring back these characters. I think that's very possible. Yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah. yeah. Like, I could see Jancy bringing back a lot of the characters that, like, we were introduced to and, like, sort of thought we might get more of, but then we didn't because now's, now's the opportunity to do so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Uh, I had a really hard time starting my reread. <clears throat> Case in point, I started it yesterday evening. <laughs> I finished, but I did start it. 20 hours ago ish you, you were slightly late to come onto the recording because you literally just finished <laughs> the book yeah 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 <laughs> and it's, it's very fresh going back to like original reactions like i was one of the ones most positive on this book and i still do really like this book it's just the beginning is very slow yeah and yeah. it's like because I like getting into the path of elders and like learning yes. all like that far ancient like cytonic stuff. Exploring the, the nowhere is very cool. It's just it takes a while to like get to the cool parts. Yeah, I, yeah, that's yeah. why I skip things. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you skip to the cool parts. That's not how my brain works, Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I filled it in with the copper mine summaries in between, so I knew which ones to skip. <laughs> it really starts with, whoa, there's a lot of wacky hijinks in the nowhere. And mm -hmm. once you've read the book, it's less good on a reread. I think that beginning part, almost, I'm I think. Yeah, I mean... I the actually dinosaur. quite liked part one, honestly. Like, I still thought it was a pretty good intro. It's more, mm -hmm. like, my, my issue is much more going into part two, because then it felt like it slowed down a lot. Mm. Yeah, part, part one's all right. One thing I did like is that, like, the foreshadowing of Doomslug and Shet, like, 
it's there. It's yeah. very clear once you know what's going on. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, what's going on? Yeah. Like, Chet's abilities and things. It's like, oh, right, you're just a Delver. And that's that's why you you know these things and can do this. I mean, that I disagree with. Because, like, yeah. it's explained, like, like, the actual Chet had those abilities. Yeah. I am... He had all the he had the long life. I don't know. Did he have the echolocation? I don't know if that's explicit. No, but like I don't feel like that has to be a Delver thing. Like that that feels plausible that Okay. Okay. Original Chet could have had I that. I guess I just thought that it was very reasonable for a Delver to understand where all the fragments were. Right? Yeah. Like that, that makes sense to but me. Like it's not a Delver thing. The Delvers are very bad at that. I guess that's true. Yeah. I have a lot of very specific things to say about the foreshadowing of Chet uh, in particular that I am not going to bring up in this episode because this is not the character episode. But I do have a lot to say about that because I actually really dislike how it was done Um, and think that it was much less foreshadowing and more you actually just needed to know the answer to make the beginning makes not make sense but like be good and if it's not good without you knowing the ending then i think that's not good so uh um, i can go into that more in the character episode i have very similar um thoughts and feelings on mbot's arc as well actually and mm-hmm. like stuff that happens with mbot, M-Bot and spencer mm-hmm. oh yeah we definitely gotta talk about that yeah. i do think though the doom slug foreshadowing is good though yeah, I think the I think the Doom Slug foreshadowing's good with the pen. Um, I really liked how that worked. I, I don't understand how the slug poop makes people be like, "Oh yeah, I retain my memory." But it's, well, I'll just go with it. It's <laughs> wacky magic, magic hi- hijinks. Like, okay, cool. <laughs> Eric and I had a conversation about this the other day, uh, and I, I was just saying, "Yeah, yeah, they they just bring in part of the somewhere." Because that's like something they can do, and that's what the reality ashes are, and that's why people don't lose their memories when they have parts of the somewhere with them. And it's just the opposite of like making cytonics by like the nowhere leaking out its radiation. And Eric didn't want to uh, accept this. Okay, he didn't to be like fair, I haven't like, gotten to that, that part of the book yet. <laughs> yeah, like that does make sense because going back to the somewhere like does return people's memories. So like it makes yeah. sense that yeah. like, having the somewhere leak in. Well, that doesn't necessarily fix you, like, helps you get closer to that. Getting yeah. further from the because fragments like, helps things. you forget things yeah. and stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, because the fragments are bits of the somewhere, yeah. right? Like, it's all mm-hmm. stuff that's leaked into the nowhere that's formed the belt. Yeah. I guess it just felt convenient with the ashes. <laughs> I'm like, okay, sure, it's, it's the slug excretion. Sure. Okay. <laughs> I did. I I had an explanation for that as well because, like, I don't think they can do something like that in the somewhere. But Doom Slug obviously like spends a lot of time around Spencer, so has clearly understands the idea of like pooping or excreting things. And like in the nowhere, she's like, "Oh, I'm excreting these. It's poop," because Spencer understands the idea of poop. It's not literal poop. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that sure. which like something they can create. Sure, <laughs> yeah, which like Spencer like does immediately. Like okay, like she's using this term. Yeah, yeah. Because it's also it's funny because like Spencer actually has a conversation more or less with Doomslug in this book, and Doomslug's like, oh, like you talk so much smarter now, and it's like <laughs> so it's like fun. Doomslug is like I'm going to explain this in the most dumbed down way possible so that maybe <laughs> my big dumb human will understand <laughs> i like it can i give, give my thoughts of the mm-hmm. the book oh yes because they have actually changed a bit oh yeah so i will say everything i thought about the book when i first read it uh still stands um <laughs> it's still made the most disliked brandon book i i i still really dislike it I still don't think it's a bad book. It's just very not, very much not what I wanted. But I can see the purpose of the book a lot clearer mm-hmm. now on a reread. Kind of look, going through span reads and rereading all the books back to back and seeing Spencer's story progress. This is kind of like 
a similar thing that we got in Skyward where Spencer really has to grow up. And instead of going from like, not that she was like super protected in the caverns or anything, but like there was that protection of childhood and like that still a level of naivety and innocence of childhood that got stripped away from her in Skyward and she had to grow up because she was actually forced into being a soldier. This is kind of her taking that step back and being offered that chance to have peace. And it's like, this is what it could be like. And she's offered it by multiple people in this book. And like, I think she has to go through this to be able to take the next step forward in growing to the point that like, she can actually face the superiority mm. and like face the Delvers properly. Because, like, as she goes through at the end of the book, like, she's been go, go, go the entire time. She's never had a chance to stop. And, like, no one could say that she didn't do her part up till this point. Mm -hmm. But she knows she's still needed. And I feel like anyone who's, like, hit that point of burnout knows that feeling of, like, I just need to rest but I also have to keep going. And if anything, this is Spencer's like realization that she's hit burnout and like, this is her chance to rest and she's having to turn it away. But I do think she is growing because of that. And like, she's going to be stronger in the next book because she's understood what she can have. So now she knows what she can aim for. So I see the point of this book a lot more than the first time I read it when it was like, why are we going off to nowhere, literally nowhere, uh, and having a side adventure when we ended with the main story being the superiority taking over the galaxy? Like, why have we put that on hold to go do this other thing? And because these are so character-centric books, it does actually make a lot of sense now. And I do think that having the novellas as like kind of the other half of book three almost, even though they're not a combined novel, helps a lot to move both parts of the story along. But I think if Spencer didn't have this, there would kind of feel like there's some sort of misstep in where she goes from at the end of Starsight to where she needs to be in Defiant. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. like this is the first time where she's truly choosing for herself in a way rather yeah, than yeah. circumstance. Yeah. yeah. And what I kind of liked, this book is what reveals to her like what she really wants. Mm. Which yeah. like, because like she's always like, oh, like I want to be like this great warrior. I want to like be a great starfighter. When it's like, no, she wants to fly. And it's like, and she's like, oh, yeah. I want to explore. Like I want to explore the stars. That's true. That's true being able to dogfight with the pirates without threat of death mm. gets her like what she wants without it being life or death. True. There was actually a line back in um, Skyward as well. I don't have mm. the specific line where she's thinking about all she wants is to be able to fly without the threat of death to her friends. Mm. Mm -hmm. And that she literally gets that chance and knows what it's actually like. So I like, I don't know if that was specifically meant to be foreshadowing, but rereading Skyward and seeing that and knowing that Cytonic exists, I loved that coming up. Mm -hmm. Which makes her choice to like return to the fight that much more impactful, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. She has the opportunity to do everything she has always wanted, but it would require sacrificing her friends, her family mm. to the superiority because they can't do it without her. Yep. Yeah, that choice worked a lot better for me on a reread, for sure, mm -hmm. because I think my initial impressions were, yeah, Spencer's never going to like legitimately stay, but on a reread... I completely forgot that the Delvers offered some kind of truce. Totally forgot that. Uh, mm -hmm. Spencer is Which totally... they were immediately planning yeah. to yeah, of course. renege on. But, yeah, they yeah, offered... but there was a compelling case for her to stay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So I, I, I liked that. And then once Spencer had to leave and go to the light burst, it's like, yeah, let's go. That's good stuff. Yeah. Did you guys notice that at the same time that the Delvers were saying, like, we will give you this treaty if you, like, stay, we won't, like, uh, work with Winsick. Chet, at the same time, was saying, you should stay and we can explore together. And I do think, like, part of that was Chet himself making mm. that decision to ask her. But it made me stop and wonder, now that I know that Chet was a Delver, how much of it could also have been part of him that's still like linked to the Delvers subconsciously knowing that they want her to stay. So he's trying to also make her stay. I, I think something like that. Cause it's the whole, like they're not a group mind. They're just identical. Like, yeah, they, yeah. they, they don't like collude to all do the th same choice. Like they just do the same choice. Mm. So it's like, it is an echo of that, I think. Yeah. Like yeah. he's had that thought because they've had that thought. And, but I think there is also more autonomy to yes. his thought. And in Chet's case, it's clearly, I don't want to know what's in that last portal. I'm terrified mm -hmm. of that. Right. Yeah. But that's also the Delvers, right? Yeah, ab they absolutely. Yeah, for sure. the for sure. yeah, because yeah. they don't want to know what's in the portal themselves. Yeah, no, I think it's absolutely like, a reflection. So when he kind of turns away from that plan of like, maybe I don't want to do this, he's reverting back to being more like the Delvers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also the fact that when they're actually flying closer to the light burst, like he starts losing his form because he didn't realize the closer he would get to the light burst, the more he would become more delver like mm -hmm. So maybe that's also playing into it because Sh mm -hmm. Shawhold is on the edge of no man's land and getting much closer to the light burst. It's harder to pretend he's just Chet Starfinder. Yeah. Explorer, intergalactic, interreality explorer. Interdimensional, I think. Interdimensional. Said. Even though he's only explored two dimensions, I believe. That's still yeah. technically interdimensional. That's true. It is. Yep. It is. Uh, I, I will say one thing that I still did not like, that I've always disliked about this book, is as soon as Pirate Champion is mentioned, I my right. eyes are rolling so hard, like, oh my god, Spence is going to become the Pirate Champion. We're doing this right and that's what course, happens because it's cool it's so it's, cool it's a waste of time <laughs> like, the, the in between of spencer saying no i mustn't and then getting to it is a little bit of a waste of time I, because I, yeah she the second you hear it you're like oh yep spencer's gonna God. participate and spencer's gonna become the pirate champion and i i still do not like the Oh, let's unite all the pirate factions and things and then attack Surehold, which I guess has to happen, but I feel, still think it I I I do not like it. Everything after the pirate champions and going to attack Surehold, love that. And I guess they need an impetus to go attack Surehold, right? Mm -hmm. I, I understand all that. It just feels like we're a little bit padding for time here. And that mm -hmm. oh God. I just it doesn't Filler actually episode. take that long in the book, all things considered. It's not that bad. Uh, I, I did kind of scan through the Pirate Champion uh, battle and just looked at the Delver parts because I'm like, wow, there's a space fight. No one's in any danger. Who cares? Okay, whatever. That, that, that's my thought. Honestly, that's always been my thought about that fight scene in the Pirate Champions because mm -hmm. my eyes are rolling so hard. Wow. Personally, like I didn't mind the pirate championship, but I think the the stuff surrounding it was more the padding. Like if mm. the chapters from where she first meets the pirates up to where they go to Shorehold, I think a lot of stuff in that could have been tighter and mm. could have it, it some of it just felt like a lot of fluff and filler that didn't necessarily have to be there. And I know some of it was to like have Spencer have that feeling of this is what I could have. Yeah. But I don't think we needed as much of it. So uh, personally, I think like the pirate championship would have felt better within the story if there was less kind of leading up to it. And it really is. I like all the Cutlass flight people. It's just 
Like I love Nebula. I, I, I liked all the conversations there, but it's just not really coming together, you know? Yeah, it's we know because Brennan has talked about it that he struggled with this book mm. very much. Yeah. Yeah. So it's hard to comment on like having to kind of scrap big parts of it. Yeah. And restart. Did he just not was time a factor? Whereas if he had spent more time on it, it might things might have crystallized a little better or was it just like no matter how much time he had like it just doesn't quite work i think maybe another draft would have made it fit together better but then you're pushing back stormlight more mm-hmm. and yeah yeah like i think someone like jess is just never going to like this book for mm-hmm. what it is right yeah and like even if it wasn't impacting timelines of other things like there's a point of diminishing returns where Mm -hmm. you're not gaining anything more as a writer by constantly revising something and you just have to accept what it is and like not everyone's gonna like any book this particular one was particularly divisive but yeah like there's only so many times brandon can go over a book timeline wise but also there's only so many times that it's worth him going over a book and he probably hit the limit for both of those. Yeah, it's the... Is it Da Vinci who was like, all art is never finished, only abandoned? Yeah, something like that. I think so. I, yeah. I don't know if he said and that. It's, like, yeah. yeah. It, it might be one of those things that is frequently misattributed to Da Vinci. Potentially. <laughs> Potentially. And I think that is an important thing to keep in mind. And perhaps like other books like brandon gets to where he wants to go a lot quicker so like when he abandons it he and readers are usually more satisfied than yeah he was able to get with this book which i i still do enjoy this book honor you read probably my least favorite (laughs) of the series (laughs) even though there are individually parts that i are some of my favorite bits of the Path of Elders, like learning so all of that stuff. Oh, yeah. Favorite scenes in the series. True. Honestly, yeah. But the whole is less than the sum of its pieces. Yeah. Yeah. But I do think that, particularly on a reread, you know what to expect going mm-hmm. into this book. And I think, like, that's always been this series' problem. But also, this book in particular, that's always been the problem is. What are people expecting going into it versus what are they actually getting? And like, it goes back to the whole divide of what did you want from this series? But yeah, like rereading it, knowing what you're getting, that definitely helped me a lot with this book. Like Mm -hmm. I still didn't like this book much, but I liked it more than the first time I read it. Stockholm Syndrome. (laughs) <laughs> I'm stuck in the nowhere. I can't just get keep out. reading it, Jesse. Eventually, you'll like it. <laughs> Don't worry. I'll just skip more and more chapters along the way. Just, just read the part from Sherhold till the end and be like, "All right, cool, I did it." For me, I am very much a a good ending can forgive a lot of sins earlier in the book. Mm-hmm. And honestly, I get to the end of Cytonic. I really like the ending. I think it's fantastic. And the Path of Elder stuff is fantastic. But yeah, it doesn't quite come together, but it's also just on average, like, fine. I wouldn't say it's bad, Mm -hmm. but it's fine. And I do think it's pretty clearly setting up maybe a book that more people want in Defiant, where he spends this in the somewhere. Yeah. We're clearly joining back with our Detritus crew, and we're going to fight some Mm -hmm. superiority and stuff. And that, I think that's that's what i want right so yeah yeah i'm looking forward to seeing the fallout of the spencer finding out everything that happened in the skyward flight books and her oh yeah what you what now that'll be interesting for brandon to man to weave in (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah going back to what jesse was saying about the important role this book plays in spencer's arc is that joseph campbell hero's journey journey hero of a thousand faces like there's a a point of like descent into the underworld where like you are forever changed sure like yeah that's this book 
Yeah. This is yeah. part of Spencer's Here's journey. She yeah. soul fuses with the Delver, whatever sure. that means. Sure. That mm-hmm. may as well happen. Yeah. <laughs> or yeah. Mm-hmm. I actually had the um realization when I was reading this book that this book is Peter Pan. Like she goes into Neverworld, yeah. like Neverland. She meets an explorer who like takes her around. There's pirates. Like it's giant adventure. And then she has to go home and actually grows up. And the explorer is the big problem anyway, because Peter Pan, <laughs> villain of that story. One thing that for me recently became more relevant from this book is uh spencer's reaction to seeing a lot of water (laughs) because i i went to california for the first time last year having lived in utah my entire life and i didn't go out on the ocean but i got to see you know what it's like and then just last month i flew from utah to california and being up in the air and seeing Dude, we thought we had rivers. We don't have rivers. Like, no. Seeing, I ended up having to fly over into San Francisco and we fly over the river that the San Francisco Bridge, you know, spans. And I'm like, it is a bay. It's not a river, but that's it's big. huge. So, Spence's reaction to a lot of water was a little bit more close to home, or <laughs> is a little bit more close to home of, oh, that's what water's like. That's really fascinating as someone who's like, who was lived on the coast the entire, my entire life, because I've never thought about it. And mm-hmm. yeah, like that would be a really big thing. Like I, I do kind of get it. I understand a bit more why people who don't grow up on the coast are like, wow, seeing the ocean is like such a big thing compared to where you live on it. Like you, you just take it a bit for granted. My yeah. commutes along the ocean, so you know it's like, yeah, okay, what oh. else? Yeah, uh, Mike, we, we go by the ocean on my way into work too, and I, yeah, I'm in the same boat as you, Jesse. It's like I've always been cl- like within half an hour of the coast, so it's like, yeah, my first time seeing the ocean, I have no memory of because I was <laughs> a baby, probably. I don't know. I have some cute photos from when I was like. I just like three-year-old toddler at the beach. <laughs> but the first time seeing the ocean is a very common trope, I feel like, mm. in literature. Yeah. That I'm familiar with, enough with it that like, oh, yes, this makes sense. Mm. But also, there's a lot of connection between the ocean and space mm. in terms of metaphor. Mm. That... Mm-hmm. Like, Ocean going vessels are ships, space going vessels also ships. And there's a lot of like nautical terminology that gets applied to space travel that even though it's a very different thing. So like it makes sense that she loves traveling space and seeing the terrestrial equivalent of that. Yeah. It would resonate with yeah, her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Particularly because she doesn't live on a planet that is anything like Earth. Yeah. So mm-hmm. she doesn't have any references except what are in the small amount of texts that have actually survived with the defiance and like there are texts that they have that do reference earth so like this is her only opportunity to have any understanding of what it could actually be like because this isn't even earth yeah words don't do the ocean justice. no no no, no. Same, no. same with like space right yeah. you, you go into space you have that uh, that that's a very common thing in sci-fi fantasy of oh wow space is crazy yeah. the planet's so small that's bonkers mm-hmm. the idea of like exploring the unknown mm-hmm. and its vastness yeah I do want to make a quick shout just to some of the stories Spencer told in this book of oh, Satan's yeah. the hero yeah oh, right and Mbot yeah I I don't. <laughs> You know, I, I don't, don't know about that, Spencer. And also the Lion King retelling. <laughs> I oh, love so cute. I don't think they had those in ancient Jap- in Japan, Spencer. I don't know. <laughs> my my Earth, my old Earth geography is really bad. I, I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> but also the reference that oh, I think Grand Grand said it. It's from Denmark. 
<laughs> because it's Hamlet. <laughs> Lion oh, King is Hamlet. <laughs> right. Yep. <laughs> yep. That's right. So I, I can see how that would get very confusing if centuries mm-hmm. later. I don't know what any of these places are. Who cares? It's fun to have that uh, kind of like subtle nod towards how like all stories are just old stories that are retold in a different way. Yeah. Yeah. Those are some good moments that honestly kind of padding, but I didn't mind because they were very funny. So mm-hmm. yeah. also the bit where Spencer's thinking about how like this is her story and she hopes that like it'll be told to people and people won't think she's real like uh gilgamesh and um david bowie oh yes (laughs) that was just really funny (laughs) it's like there's no way this guy could have actually been a real person yeah Yeah. nope he was yeah and it's references like that that it's like oh this is why brandon couldn't put it in the cosmere because he wanted to have those references that we would find funny as an audience yeah Mm -hmm. And really, the mentions of stories in this storybook nature really does fit with the theme of Spencer's arc of, oh, mm-hmm. this is like her storybook. Like, if she stays, this is her storybook thing that she can live forever and ever in. Mm-hmm. And so yeah, that, that does work pretty well for me. Yeah, she really, like, she has the main character syndrome, but, like, she's going from thinking of herself as a character in a story to understanding what it's like to be a person in real life Mm. and Mm -hmm. what like the differences between the fairy tale story and the harsh realities of of life and like how to deal with that yeah and also seeing what happens when all you have left are the stories with yes with what she thinks chet is Yeah, yeah 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 Well, this is a lot of character talk. Uh, do yeah, we have any yeah, you know, other? But it's um, so connected that this is such a Spencer arc book that I feel like you yeah. can't talk about overall. It's thoughts. a character book. Yeah, very yeah. much so. Overall, I think this book is fine. That's my that's yeah. my resounding <laughs> endorsement. Uh, it's probably more than a five out of ten for me, but I don't think it's more than a seven. Like on average, if you take the whole thing, like the ending is really yeah. good and does really raise it up and makes it work really well for me. I don't actually hope, I don't know if this would ever happen, but in the future, uh, Cytonic and Skyward Flight get rebranded a bit so that they're both book three. Mm. And it's kind of like, book, not even book three, part one and two, but like somehow they're both indicated to be, okay, these are both book three read them in whatever order you want, but they're both so connected to what comes before and presumably what comes after that Mm -hmm. you do actually need both. Whereas like when Cytonic first came out, it's like, well, we've got some of Skyward Flight, we've got Cytonic, but we don't have Evershore. It was still so up in the air of what do you need to read? What don't do, what don't you need to read? And like, as someone who didn't really like Cytonic, I was like, wow, I wish I could have just read the Skyway books, but now I understand why you do need to read Cytonic mm-hmm. as well. Even if you don't read it like super in depth, if you don't want to, like it is still very relevant. It'll be interesting seeing reviews for Defiant come out and yeah. how many people go into it having only read Cytonic. Because yeah, like, yeah. oh, like the novellas are side things, even though they're really not. Yeah. And that's the problem with calling them novellas is people will think they're not necessary, like they're not required for the series. And personally, like, I think they will be. Uh, Yeah. Though if you haven't read the um, novellas, and I'm going to do a very quick plug for the channel I haven't made a video for in almost 18 months, uh, I have an entire series going through every single book in uh, the Skyward universe, side of our series that gives a... Um, recap of every book that we have been linking. So yeah, it's cool. Them all. It's called Claim the Stars, and it's all on YouTube. So if you yeah. if you need a quick overview of what happens in the novellas, I've got three videos for you. We linked them all in our uh, Skyward Flight uh, uh, reactions. <laughs> They're all in the description. Yeah. Also, if point. you haven't read them, we read covered them. those first. You should have done that before you come <laughs> yes. to here. And, and honestly, <laughs> real talk. I think our reading order is the best reading order. You should absolutely mm. read Skyward yeah. Flight first. And I think 
Cytonic will feel less meh when you can go directly into Defiant, I feel like. Because mm-hmm. then, like, th- think about it like this. You get Skyward, Starsight, and Starsight's a little different. And so if you miss some of the Skywardy aspect, the Skyward Flight, and then Cytonic, mm-hmm. a little different. And I'm imagining Defiant's going to be, you know, much more like Skyward. And yeah. we're, we're going to yeah. see Skyward Flight and Spencer interact, so... <laughs> That's that's the hope. That's the um, hope. God, <laughs> we're not going to go to Java Flight School. No. <laughs> my other hope is that once we get Skyward Legacy with Shamsine's mm-hmm. writing, mm-hmm. the whole cohesiveness of the Cytoverse will be a little bit more on par. Where right now Skyward Flight is the only thing not written by Brandon. Mm. It's easier to discard out of yeah. hand. Yeah. But once no Jancy is a equal member of the Cytoverse writing community yeah. <laughs> of two people uh, that it'll be harder to discount them. Yeah. Yeah. Like there are two writers in this universe. It's not just Brandon plus a co-author on some books. Yeah. 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 I do think I disagree a little bit with Eric uh, about the reading order though like i in general would say read skyward flight first unless you are a massive Scott, uh, spencer and book fan that is true just read cytonic like that is true, that's the one sure. you're gonna like more and like there are people who are in it for spencer and Embot adventures and like they didn't mind the lack of skyward flight in um star Sight. And that is totally fine. Yeah, go That's read true. Cytonic. It's going to probably feel more jarring if you go from Starsight into three books that don't have the main characters, mm. if that's why you're there. So yeah, re- read Cytonic first, though I do agree that probably going from the end of Cytonic into Defiance is probably going to be a lot more fun. Yeah. Like, whereas like the end of yeah. Evershore is like ambiguous time-wise, yeah. whereas it seems pretty clear that Cytonic is directly before defiant yeah and even though cytonic picks up directly where star sight ends there's enough recap there that yeah. having a break isn't the worst thing yeah i yeah, i didn't yeah. mind it uh reading yeah. through because at least when you go from star sight to cytonic star sight just ends on okay this is this is just what's happening i need to know what happens next right but i actually yeah. didn't mind doing skyward flight and then Cytonic, and Cytonic's yeah. just such a different book, so it's mm-hmm. fine. And there's also an element, Spencer disappearing into the unknown and not getting that answered immediately is intriguing to me. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And honestly adds to reading Skyward Flight, right? Like, oh man, mm-hmm. it would be great if Spencer was here, but I don't know what's going on with her, you know? Mm-hmm. Until you yeah. get those few little flashes of... Oh, yes. And those are so fun if you don't know what's happening in the other one. Because you're like, wow, okay, this this was not expected. I, I do love the interludes here where Spencer's yeah. talking with Jorgen. Like, I think that's yeah. stellar. And, oh, Jorgen has his face cut off by something like, oh, I know what happened there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh. Something I noticed with this that, like, oh, we couldn't really get completely when Cytonic came out because not all the novellas were out is all of the references to the novellas and like knowing what's in them Mm. versus like reading the interludes and not quite being able to put together what's happening and I think Mm. that just says so much about how well Jancy wrote those books to fit in with what was presented in the Cytonic interludes of what was happening outside of the nowhere and like they fit together so so well for me yeah they they do belong together it, it reminds me a bit jess of how lord of the rings each lord of the rings book is like two books in one right like two towers is a sam the frodo sam stuff is just we're not interspersing these viewpoints at all. Oh, no. <laughs> they were just like, here's chunk of this, here's chunk of Sam and Frodo. And this kind of reminds me of that, mm. where you can take uh, uh, all the Skyward Flight, you can take all of Cytonic. I don't think mixing the chapters together would work super great because of the tone mismatch yeah. that we talked about last time. But 
But I wonder You'd if have to it's read like rice to them. Yeah. I do kind of want like a just a giant book at one point of all of them, but like the parts are mixed together instead of chapters. Mm. So like maybe like you have the first part of Saitone, <laughs> but then you get like star <laughs> um, summary. <laughs> it's look, we read <laughs> um, I mean like compare <laughs> It'd be like, longer than Rhythm of War. Well, the font like, is a lot bigger in these books, Ian, than once, Stormlight. I feel like once you get to the point that you're willing to read a plus thousand page book, does it really matter how much longer it is over a thousand pages? I don't know. It was just funny seeing the width of Cytonic. You No, you should get Cytonic and Star Sight, Ian. Get those two. Because I think Starsight is, <laughs> yeah, no, we're, we're doing demonstrations here. Thanks, audio listeners. Thanks for... <laughs> Go watch the video. Go watch the video. So, uh, Cytonic no, is Cytonic's just... Cytonic's, like, slightly shorter. Cytonic's yeah. slightly shorter. Slightly wow. thinner. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It, it's kind of hard to tell a little bit. Yeah. And, like, it's going to look different by different editions, right? Yeah, like true. the fact yeah. that we can get like a handheld size version of Stormlight books <laughs> is bizarre <laughs> considering <laughs> how big those things are. They're still bludgeoning objects. Font, font size very small and paper very thin. <laughs> <laughs> Make uh, sure you have good reading light and wear your glasses if you need them. Yeah, Star Sight's about 40 to 50 pages longer. Okay, okay not them. that much longer. I don't know. I, I am very excited for Defiant itself and to yes. see if Brandon brings it together. I'm concerned, but I think it I think Brandon great. Brandon always planned this book in the nowhere, right? That that mm -hmm. would always happen. So I think Brandon can bring it together. Because initially it was meant to be three books, right? And it got extended to four books. <sighs> I'm never sure if like he wrote Skyward first and then realized he needed another book. So I'm I'm not really sure he had a concrete outline until he finished Skyward at all. Yeah, okay. Which is usually the way he does it. He'll write the first book, then outline the rest of the series. Yep. Yeah. And it has it's just a bit some in this case, because like books two two and three and presumably four work really well together, and book one is like over here in the corner. Mm -hmm being super different. I think that strategy has led to some series weirdness with this and Era 2. <laughs> so, oh, I was maybe just the about best. to mention Era yeah. 2. <laughs> like, yeah. oh, ooh, there's some interesting things here. Like, I know Brandon's referred to Skyward as a prequel at some point to the rest of the series, and maybe I it's worth that. them actually rebranding Skyward as a prequel God. but the problem is the people treat prequels like they do novellas they're not required reading do you not just read start Star book Sight one first. right but imagine starting with Star Sight no. you're like I don't know what's going on no oh, terrible starting point yeah anyway you can stay tuned for our <laughs> defiant reactions coming uh like a week November or two 2023 well, Defiant comes out November 23. I think uh, our reactions will come out like a week later. And so I think early in December. <laughs> but December 2023. Yeah. <laughs> Defiant reactions. Uh, will we duel to the death like we did Star Sight and Cytonic? Maybe. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I just want something to redeem this series for me. Like, I loved it so much. You got it with Skyward it, Flight. <laughs> Skyward Flight's really good. Like, I, I really like Skyward Flight, but because it isn't the ending of the story, like, mm. it's like you, Eric. Like, you have a bad ending. True. Like, a bad ending can True. ruin a good book. You. Absolutely. I need this ending to, like, give me yeah. closure for this series. <laughs> yeah, honest, honestly, yes, because if it's pretty mediocre, you'd be like, eh, do I really want to recommend Skyward? It's a little kind of a tough sell. But if, it, if Brandon sticks the landing, then uh, that would be different, right? Like, I've been talking to some people who read Sanderson, and they asked me about his non-Cosmere, and I'm like, well, I've read Skyward, but I honestly don't know how to recommend it to people anymore, because I don't know if I do want to recommend it. It's something that I really like, but at the same time, I'm like, will other people like it? I don't want to give a recommendation 
that I know other people might not like. And it's also, no matter how it ends, it's a series, you're going to have set clear expectations with people when you recommend <laughs> yeah. it. You can't just yeah. say, like, read this, I'm not going to tell you anything. Yeah. Like, yeah. with the whole secret project thing. It's like, nah, you need a bit of context for this. Yeah. So you don't make the wrong there, assumptions. There's, there's some yeah. disjointedness. And if, if it comes together, awesome. This is very much the set the expectations series. Like yeah, it, yeah. it needs the expectations set. The problem is you don't want to recommend this as the first series to people because mm. it is so divisive. Yeah. And you're like, I don't want people to not read other Brandon books because they didn't like this one. And then they'll think this is what his other writing is like. It's like, no, no, Brandon's writing is really good. Go read something else first and see what it's like, and then you'll trust him. And then if you don't like this, that's fine. But you yeah. know he's good. Yeah. Go read Miss Born Arrow 1, yes. where he wrote yes. all of them for, to together and then released them. Because honestly, I think that's where Brandon writes his best work. Is yeah. when everything's written and he can edit it together. <laughs> And he knows what the ending is. It will be interesting to see how uh, Stormlight does. I, because he's yeah. outlined it really, really well. Uh, Every I think step there's of some the series way. we are missed too. I was actually about to say the opposite, Mish. Like, I do think Stormlight's really good. And I think, like, reading through the books, you're like, wow, this, like, forms together really well. Once you've read all the books and you go back and reread it, though, there's some things that are quite clunky together. And yeah. I think it really shows that, like, he has outlined book by book, but mm -hmm. sometimes things in the later books don't necessarily line up well with the things in the earlier books. My mm -hmm. difficulty recommending Mistborn Era 1 is that the prose is just a lot weaker because Brandon's just a lot better of a writer. E even in Cytonic, there's some good prose, in interesting description. I love the stuff in No Man's Land, right? Like, that's really stellar stuff and uh i haven't reread era one in a while but i know getting started in that it's a little rougher and so mm -hmm. i do think that does give people like oh man i don't know if i like this prose i do think it's a good um entry point if you haven't read adult sci-fi fantasy before yeah. though mm -hmm. and a lot of people like that has been their entry point into adult sci-fi fantasy yeah though the first book is a bit dense to begin with so like it does take a bit of pushing through even then yeah but if you get through that to a point that you're like really hooked it's really easy to pull yourself through it yeah whereas like something like stormlight you really need to be committed to get through that first book yeah to want to keep going like it it's a lot harder it's going to get more and more difficult to tell people to where to start yeah See, with the secret projects, though, I think, like, those have actually helped give yeah. better starting points. Like, there's standalones. You actually don't need background knowledge for at least, like, Yumi and Tress. Mm -hmm. Like, you can just go in and be like, oh, here's a bunch of things I don't understand yet. And then go into other books and understand them later. And they've written really well. Like, they have yeah. Brandon's, like, now current writing ability. But they aren't, like... They aren't multiple books in a series and like they are easy, like they're fun stories to read. Like it's a love story and a pirate story. Like th a those better are pirate story than this one. fun story and the love story. <laughs> Which one do you want? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I am excited, Ian, to have Brandon actually write a series straight through and get that same experience yeah. and yeah. get that quality and cohesiveness because for all his outlining chops, it's a lot less outlined than we think. I think like this book clearly had this ending with the Delvers. That that was clearly a touchstone. He knew mm -hmm. exactly where he was going with that, I feel like. But a lot of the middle stuff are like, eh, how much pirate stuff's going to happen? Eh, you know, like I think that is more he's discovery writing characters and stuff and feeling what mm -hmm. fits well for the book. And he probably feels a little too restricted if he outlines that all in advance. Yeah, like he's he said, like he will rewrite an outline if characters develop to a point where it no longer makes sense. Yeah. It's what's the metaphor 
honor uses for looking into the future it's like it's a shattering window yeah and yes. like the further in the future the more peace it's it's in is like the closer to the end of like a series there are fewer branches potentialities so yeah it's, i like generally his endings for the most part because at that point he doesn't have to contend with like well this series could go in these 10 different ways it's like okay this is the story of this series mm-hmm. now i just have to wrap it up yeah it's converging yeah mm-hmm. Anyway, stay tuned for Defiant <laughs> later. <Yeah. and laughs> our last few Cytonics fan reads, because uh, let's, let's hope it's, let's hope it's good. So. Awesome. Any other thoughts in Bay House? Hope mm-hmm. you enjoyed that uh, overall Brandon <laughs> discussion. Yeah, there. complete tangent, not related to this book, really. Also, the ocean, uh, also featuring ocean <laughs> in this episode. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you for watching. You can find us at 17thshard.com for all the news, discussion, theories, and fun that you could ever want. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, SoundCloud. You can leave us a review on iTunes. You can subscribe on YouTube, and you can also support us on Patreon. See you next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.